All right. Oh. Uh, hi there. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Giovanni. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I love coming to Berlin. Every time I come, I have a lot of fun. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, A-B testing um, and how we do that at LinkedIn. Uh, I've been with LinkedIn for five years now, um, and uh, part of my job has been also to uh, develop our A-B testing infrastructure. Um, so hopefully I can give a little bit of uh, interesting insights on how we do it and also some of the issues we ran into. Uh, a few stories uh, of you know, successes, but also um, things that didn't go that well. Um, interrupt me anytime if you want to ask questions. I'd like to make this interactive. Um, so A-B testing, everybody should be familiar with this concept. Uh, how many of you have a A-B testing practice in your company? Everybody, perfect. Okay, so um, this is uh, the home page. Um, uh, when you land on LinkedIn um, and you're not logged in, um, this is the global one on the left, A, uh, what we use for the entire world. B is what we tried in, uh, what we are using in Germany. It actually has uh, some localized pictures and also an explanation underneath, uh, below the fold, of what LinkedIn does. Um, as you know, in Germany, uh, professional social networking is still not as developed as say, in the United States, and so you need to explain more. Um, and so the way that we evaluate the performance of this page is to go and look at you know, what's the conversion rate, how many people sign up. The main purpose of this page is to get people to sign up or to log in if they're already members. Um, I will ask the question and we'll come back to it. So keep in mind uh, this question, which one do you think actually performs the best? Think about it as we talk uh, in the, in, in, during, the, during the talk. But before going into the details of uh, A-B testing, I want to go back to the vision of LinkedIn because really this is what drives uh, everything we do, including A-B testing. Our vision is that of um, creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. There are 3.2 billion people in the global workforce and we want to serve all of them. Currently, LinkedIn is a professional network site, um, so it has a smaller audience right now. Uh, but that's ultimately where we want to go to. Um, and so if you look at LinkedIn, everybody thinks about the site as a network. Uh, anybody wants to guess what this network is? This picture in particular? Any guesses? Connection graph, Connection graph of what? Of what organization? No, it's actually LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, actually, that was a, would have been a good one. I, would, I should have charted that one. Uh, but it actually shows how you can actually aggregate uh, and, and discover a lot of things about organizations just by looking at a chart like this. For example, um, I sit in the blue cloud here, right? And we are connected with people in finance because there is a lot of analytics in finance at LinkedIn. A lot of our analytics teams are actually in the finance team, so there's a lot of communication. Um, and then, you know, you have some connections to the sales teams across the world. In fact, LinkedIn is mostly sales. Uh, the engineering team is um, only a third of the company. Um, but actually, LinkedIn is much more than just uh, a connection between people. Uh, we like to talk about the economic graph. The economic graph is the people, but also the companies they work at, the jobs that people have at those companies, the skills that you need to actually get these jobs, and the education institutions where you can learn these skills. What we want to build is more than just a network of people, we want to build an economic overlay, a digital overlay over the economy of the world. And this is the economic graph. It's the connections between people, companies, skills, knowledge, uh, all of the things that create uh, economic value in the world. Why is this important? Well, because it actually um, you know, drives our global footprint um, and it also determines how we build our testing system and our testing infrastructure. Um, so, LinkedIn's revenue comes from three main sources. Uh, talent solutions, uh, which is our recruiting business, advertising, marketing solutions, and then premium subscriptions. Why is this important? Premium subscriptions actually was the reason why we started building our A-B testing infrastructure. Um, before 2012, we really didn't do uh, systematic A-B testing with tools. It was mostly data scientists. At the time, the company was, you know, we had uh, 400 engineers. So it was a relatively small company, and we had a team of maybe 10 or 20 data scientists working on A-B testing, one for each of the teams, uh, and a lot of manual work. Um, and so the product manager for premium subscription said, I want to do more tests because I think we can actually get more money by 
testing uh, this page. This is the picker page where you choose which plan to use. Lots of traffic, and it actually does matter which one you choose because some of these plans have a $100 lifetime value, some of the plans have a $1,000 lifetime value. Right, so you want to be able to test this really, really relentlessly. So he went to the analytics team and said, instead of doing all this analysis, why don't you build a tool to do the analysis? Uh, and so you'll have more time. That this goes back to what Mark was saying just a few minutes ago. You know, measure, build, build, measure, and then analyze. Uh, instead of analyzing manually, just build a tool so we can do everything automated. You don't have to. So this is what came out of that initial effort. This is our first uh, A-B testing tool. As you can see, very crude, very primitive. This is 2012 four years ago. Um, you can see on the right-hand side um, the conditions, uh, or the test conditions, control, uh, experiment, and so forth. Um, and then on the top, the name of the test. I actually had to go and dig up my email archives because I had taken by random chance a screenshot of this thing at the time. Uh, and then on the main pane, you see the um, metrics and how they are affected. Um, and it's really hard to read, but uh, actually, there is a little call out here that says significant or not significant. Obviously, when you do A-B testing, statistical significance is really, really important. Otherwise, you really cannot trust the data, right? Um, so we built this thing. Um, and then we started thinking, um, this is really cool. And A-B testing took off at the company. We were doing probably dozens of A-B tests uh, a month. Uh, before having the tools, because it takes a day or two for the data scientists to set up the test analytics and so forth. Um, we are now doing more than 500 tests a week. So each dot represents a week of, uh, of, of testing. So um, it's at this point pervasive. LinkedIn has become extremely data-driven uh, as a company because of the introduction of these, these tools, these automated tools. Um, um, we process terabytes of data from the event stream. Uh, we are not as big as uh, Facebook, uh, so we were talking about uh, Facebook earlier, uh, but still, LinkedIn is a pretty big site. We have you know, hundreds of millions of people coming every, every month, um, and so a lot of, and we track everything, a, a lot of the activity on the site is, is going through metrics. And um, you know, we built, over time, a very sophisticated system. This is the only uh, chart of this kind you'll see in this presentation. Um, there is a large team building all these different pieces, uh, the important thing here is that we actually um, built the system so that it can feed multiple front ends. So A-B testing is one of the many analytics front ends we have. We also use the same uh, pipeline of data to uh, feed our BI tools. So all of the reporting that we have at LinkedIn is perfectly in sync with, a with the A-B testing front end. So the numbers you will see on one tool are exactly the same numbers you see on the other tool. So we have feed data coming from the applications. They get processed in HDFS and Hadoop uh, to create metrics. And then the metrics get rolled up into Pinot, which is our OLAP type of um, uh, cubing engine. Uh, and all the uh, correlations get, get computed there. And then you have a user interface. Um, so we built all this thing. And then the um, subscriptions PM was really happy. And so he started doing tests and more tests and more tests. And he realized that by testing and testing and testing, he could build a lot of variants of the same page um, and a lot of different SKUs because now we could test not three SKUs of the product. We could test five, 10, 15. We ended up with 27 SKUs. Um, so complicated that nobody knew what to buy at this point anymore. We hit a wall. We did so much testing. We optimized so much. Um, for conversion that we said, okay, well, we create a slightly different page for these types of users, it will convert better. So we'll create another page. And then we said, well, but there's another category of users, so we'll create another page. And so we created basically a whole set of um, different landing pages for those subscriptions. It became very complicated. We started getting feedback from users. It's not really clear exactly which one I should buy. Um, and so this is the first um, lesson we learned uh, with A-B testing, which is it's a great tool but it doesn't replace human judgment and, and, and uh, product judgment. And um, the risk with uh, testing too much and only being driven by the A-B testing is that you end up in local maximum. So you optimize the locality, but you'll see there's a bigger mountain ahead of you where you could actually go, but A-B testing will not bring you there. You actually have to decide in, intentionally 
cut all that crap, let's start again from the beginning and create a better experience for the users. Um, this page now performs much better than the 27 pages we had before, uh, but it took a while. So when we started to ramp this page, A-B testing was telling us negative, not good. Um, but the product managers and the engineering managers realized that there was, you know, that we couldn't continue on that path. We had to rethink it radically. Now, with a lot of optimizations, we got back to a much higher uh, maximum, so to speak. And this page, much simpler, converts much better than all the older pages we had before. So, just a cautionary tale, um, but I thought this was interesting because actually it informed the way that we think about A-B testing at the company at LinkedIn. It's not just about analytics, it's not just about measure, it's also a culture. You actually have to build a culture of understanding what A-B testing means uh, and how to use it and how to uh, plug it into the uh, development process of your code. Um, so we have five dimensions here. I will not go through the whole thing. I will just give you a few examples of what this means in practice. Um, strategy is uh, essentially choosing the right metrics, what you want to measure. Um, we only have at the top line, I would say a dozen metrics that we really, really care about at LinkedIn. Uh, although, as you saw in the previous slide, we measure 3,000 metrics across the system. But those 3,000 metrics are not all true north metrics. Those are things like the conversion on a specific page or for a specific set of users. Um, individual product managers may use that one metric, but in reality, the company only cares about um, a limited set. Um, culture, uh, which means um, understanding how A-B testing fits in the bigger picture, as I spoke about the subscriptions example. Also, transparency. If I'm running a test that's hurting somebody else, we want to make sure that the other person uh, metric actually is, uh, is visible and they know that your experiment is actually affecting neg negatively their metric, even if my metric is going up. We have 120 product managers and thus engineering teams at LinkedIn. Uh, not all of them have um, OKRs that are fully aligned. Some of them are, you know, you're hurting here a little bit. A classic example, and this came up also in the Facebook, is, um, is feed with advertising and content, which, which one should you prioritize? Um, team knowledge is just the basic knowledge about how to conduct these tests. We have trainings all year round. Uh, every new PM goes through a training to understand how to do A-B testing. And then the platform, the technology needs to be sound and statistically sound, correct. Uh, and finally, process. You wanna be able to have the right checks in place that you know, when you create a new product, you actually um, test it in the right way. And so all of our data scientists at this point, more than doing analytics, they're actually enforcing the process and the culture. Um, so very different change in the role, very different role that they play now compared to three years ago. Uh, so a few examples. This is a, actually a screenshot from our current A-B testing uh, platform. Um, what it, this tool shows basically is the name of the experiment, and then the statistical power it reached, so this one is um, at full power, and then um, the statistically s uh, significant results of this test. In this case, um, this is a, um, um, you know, changing the payment methods in, the, in some of the experiences, and it's showing a 3% increase in bookings. Right, so by running a lot of these tests, we can actually improve um, performance. Every time it's three, five, ten percent 10%, but it accumulates over time. Um, so, uh, this, the, the platform has been completely redesigned from the time that uh, I showed you the previous screenshot to actually be much more statistically sound. And we introduced things like uh, the indication of the statistical significance, uh, the power, to make sure that the users actually use it in the right way, um, that they only consider tests that are statsig and so forth. Uh, the other thing that we built uh, as part of this is an estimation of um, the sidewide impact. So if you have a, uh, a, a test that tells you there is a 13% increase, right, does that actually mean that the 13% is across the entire site? Right? No, because it only affects the people who actually see that thing. And so you actually have to evaluate it in the context of the broader site. So if you click on that uh, tile, and unfortunately I couldn't get a screenshot in time for the presentation, but if you click on the blue tile, it opens a big window but it shows you the actual absolute number. And that's very helpful because when you're trading off between two the things, for example, you know, in, the, you know, in one flow, you could be showing one page before the other. 
Obviously, the page that's first will have an increase. The other page will show a decrease in the metric that the page is driving. But what's the actual absolute number of these two numbers uh, value that, that you, because you can do the trade-off? So actually, this is super helpful for the teams to evaluate. Oftentimes, these determinations are uh, involving multiple product managers. So there is a negotiation between the PMs on what's the right balance um, to strike there. Um, the other thing that we have is a feature that is following tests. So I can say, I'm interested in this test. I want to track it over time. Uh, this one in particular is something that we were running just a few weeks ago, uh, in which we change the way we standardize uh, member titles. So when you write on your LinkedIn profile, software engineer, uh, you know, we understand that. But if he writes code ninja, that's also a software engineer. Right? So standardization does that, does under understanding these things. Um, and so we changed the model, and this, uh, um, we were testing this, this model. But the interesting thing is I started following this test. I get emails when the test has new numbers and, and updates. Um, the other thing that uh, we built as part of that is follow metrics. So if I own, say, for example, signups, and there is somebody who's coming in and, um, and building a product that affects my number, I will be notified if my number goes up or down. So every week I'll get an email report with which experiments are affecting my metric. This is increases transparency across the system. It also creates a uh, positive reinforcement for PMs and for engineers because they know they're not you know, supposed to hurt other people's metrics. Uh, but sometimes you know, you're so focused on delivering that you will say, okay, I'll just you know, run this experiment, or maybe you don't even look at the other people's metrics, right? In this case, everybody's notified. So it creates a positive feedback loop within the company as well. So it actually can be used also for anomaly detection. So there was an, a, a set of code that um, uh, add, um, changed the, how the profile uh, that um, top ads are being shown. And so at some point, the machine uh, noticed a decline in the CTR rate. And this was uh, announced through the most impactful experiments feature. The PM who is responsible for this ads product got an email saying, hey, your metric is going down and this experiment is driving that decline. And so they went and looked. So this is what the feature looks like. Any guesses of what have caused the decline in the metric in this feature? Any thoughts? It was not as visible. Five pixels less on the, on the white space. This was just a, a change in the CSS configuration of that, of that page. Right? Uh, but the cool thing is that the system automatically detected the anomaly and, and the PM who cared about this noticed it. Obviously you want to know you know, what's going on before the CEO calls and says, hey, why is your ad revenue down by 20%? Um, so today we measure everything we can. Um, we measure not only product features and UI, which is what you know, a lot of A-B testing has traditionally done. We measure um, you know, improvements in our algorithms. Like for example, people you may know, we have models and we test models separately and all of that runs through our A-B testing system. Um, we measure backend changes. Um, we can measure configuration updates within the systems, um, as well as um, we evaluate models using A-B testing as well. So we don't have to do an, any more analytics when we have a new relevance model, for example. It's all running through this system. Um, we also measure changes in our standardized data sets. So I was making the example earlier, uh, you know, when you have to understand what a code ninja is, that system, that um, standardization system is actually pretty complex we try to automate that uh, evaluation as much as possible. And finally, we even test data center architecture. So when we, for example, move traffic from one center to the other, uh, we can actually detect uh, the speed speed, which is also being tested inside the system um, and, and look at it. Um, we use two units right now for testing. So we can test on members or on guests, meaning that uh, the metric is measured on a given member or a given guest. But we also want to start adding corporate accounts as well, um, uh, which allows us to make do tests based on customers. Um, and sometimes these customers have multiple users associated with them. So the you know the so what is you know we test all of it. Um, 
What is coming in the next few years, just to give you a sense of where we are in our development, this is a constantly evolving um, set of tools. Uh, the first one is um, intraday, meaning that you can start testing the same day that you release the code after a few hours, so if you have enough data. Um, this goes back to what uh, Mark was saying earlier. For us, speed is a strategic uh, priority. Being able to run tests in hours and not in days or weeks allows us to innovate way more quickly, right? So uh, the main uh, uh, concern that our product managers had and main request was always, you know, can I run my test within a few minutes if I have enough data? And so we are building the entire infrastructure based on that, um, which means we have to re-architect. We did a uh, block diagram I showed earlier with all the metrics coming in from the system. Hadoop it currently takes a couple of hours uh, to create metrics for us before all the data is in. Um, and so, you know, we want to make that time go down to minutes. And sometimes what we'll do, we'll prioritize certain metrics over others. So we'll actually have quality of service on the metrics. Some metrics that are more important will be computed first, and then we compute the other ones later. Right. Uh, but the goal is that of, of, of decreasing the cycle time. The cycle that's at, at analyze, build, analyze, and test, and uh, um, measure and analyze cycle is super important. The other thing that we are doing is actually rebuilding our uh, UI to reinforce the culture. Um, as I mentioned, the testing culture is, is critical. Um, it's all about how people use these tools. And so the new version of our A-B testing system um, reinforces uh, that, that pentagram that I showed earlier. Um, so we are introducing collaboration and social features inside uh, our testing system so that the site reliability engineers, when they ramp a test, they actually inform, notify the PMs. The PMs are informed when some test actually affects their metrics negatively. They can collaborate on the tool. Um, and we also integrated all of this with our ramp control system. So when we ramp up a feature, it automatically flows into the, into the testing environment. Um, and then finally, we, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we merged together A-B testing and BI, um, and so basically it's the same set of numbers that powers all of the uh, analytics functions at LinkedIn at this point. Um, so this is uh, currently being built. This is actually a mock that I took from, uh, um, from uh, let's see if it actually works if I click on the link, um, from our designs. Um, and you can see um, how um, you know, we have, we cut, cut the date in all kinds of ways, and we have people talking about the tests and collaborating online. Now, if I can manage to go back to the presentation, there you go. Um, why is it not? Oh, so going back to the initial question, which one do you think worked better? of these two alternatives. Again, uh, left is the global homepage, right is the German version, and uh, this is the one we ramped in Germany, 50-50, we did an experiment here in Germany. That one? Why? Bigger call of action. Um, yeah, they're not precisely to scale, as you can see from the top bar. Um, any other guesses? No? They, in fact, they performed exactly the same. Absolutely no difference. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it there uh, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, that was super insightful. Um, my, uh, so my biggest question is how do you do this on your apps? Because app is a very important platform for LinkedIn. And a lot of us use LinkedIn via apps. So how do you replicate such a super cool infrastructure also for apps? And with native apps, then it's much more challenging, right? So how do you do it? Yeah, so, um, so on the app side, obviously the UI is all on desktop, right? I mean, yes, there are some features that work on mobile as well if you want to use them. But in reality, the, what really matters for the app is uh, tracking, so the metrics. So we have a, uh, it used to be that apps were separate until 2014, we had uh, the stack for the app was completely different and it was really hard to do A-B testing on apps because um, a lot of the, app, well, the apps are hard coded, it's packaged software, right? Um, so what we did is we started, so we, first of all, you want to measure everything, right? So you still can do the measuring part. The A-B testing, you actually have to build it into the app. 
Uh, that said, uh, we started um, creating configurable uh, portions of the app so that you can actually do um, A-B testing without having to re-release the package, but it only affects certain, certain pieces. So for example, everything that's server side you can do. If it's a UI feature on the app, in some cases it's configurable and you can tell the app to show one version or the other uh, in programmable. In some cases you have to re-release the app to actually get the A-B test in, right? Um, but we are trying to push as much as possible because we want to increase the speed of that cycle, right? Um, can you expand a bit on your uh, stopping criterion and um, in your experience, um, Bayesian versus frequentist approaches to A-B testing? Sorry, what was? Oh. Okay. I, uh, so again, can you talk a bit about the stopping criterion? Stopping. Stopping criterion of your A-B tests. So when do you stop your A-B tests? Okay, yep. And also the Bayesian versus the frequentist approaches for Bayesian? Bayesian. So oh, Bayesian, I see, I see, okay, okay. yeah. Um, uh, I think I can answer the first piece, and probably the second one I would refer you to kind of more at the engineering side. Um, so on the stopping criteria, it uh, really boils down to whether the experiment has uh, statistical power. Um, you know, if you see that, um, you know, you get to a point in which you're satisfied with the results, and meaning that the positive results are statistically significant, and the neutral results have enough power that you can actually trust that it's actually neutral and it's not just a, a statistical anomaly, then we stop doing the B test and then we choose which variant we want to ramp. Typically, features are chained together, right? So you need to you know, evaluate the test in order to progress in your development. And so we try to get to that point as quickly as possible. So part of the culture is actually training the product managers to ramp in the right way. To give you an example, um, earlier in the history of LinkedIn, we used to ramp very slowly. We said, oh, we'll ramp it to a company, check everything is fine, then we'll ramp it to 1%, wait a week, check that everything's fine, then we'll ramp to 5%. There is no real reason, once you're past like the debugging phase, to ramp so slowly, right? Because at the end of the day, you want to get to your answer fast. So you might as well go from one to 50 and just you know, get in, in hours rather than you know, wait weeks and do one, five, 10, 15, you know, 20, whatever. That's part of the culture. That's not something, you know, the tool is now built to enforce it. So they'll actually tell you, hey, why are you ramping only to 5%? Ramp it to 50 because you will get the results in X day or hours rather than five days. So we built as part of the tool also some of these um, very simple analytics. It will tell you how long it will take to get to power, right? A few weeks, a few months, or you know, a few days. Right? Just a quick question. So when you run some tests, like you just see results, or you see some results after a few hours or days, but some of the results only show after, I don't know, some weeks. Because uh, the influence, no, it's not about the sample size, it's just that some features influence on the short term, right. and on the long term, they ah, have no effect. So that's a great question. How do you actually manage that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so at the moment, our measurement system is able to measure things that happen at the same time. So the correlation is computed on a daily basis or hourly, in the case of the hourly tests. There are longer term effects. Uh, a classic example, which is really important at LinkedIn, is we know that if you get to 30 connections, long term, your engagement increases. We know that if you get to 90, there's another step up of engagement, right? That's not something that you would be able to measure with this because the test would not be running that long to actually see that increase. In, in, uh, so for that, you know, we resort to a combination of offline and cohort analysis. Um, we have built some tooling to do cohort analysis in an automated fashion, but at the moment it's still a little bit manual. So that's the other area which I didn't mention, but in our plans for next year um, is actually to enable more of that uh, to happen, right? So that you can do the longer term testing as well. Um, the problem is that you can, you know, one way to solve that would be to say, okay, I'll just say, okay, you know, hit 30, good, right? But that's based on knowledge of things that happened in the past. But in the future, the number 30 might change, right? And so you have to continue tracking it over time. But it's a great point. It's complicated. Hello. Uh, do you have any sampling strategy embedded in your tool, or do you do it manually outside? I mean, for the sample size and for the targeting. <laughs> Yeah, so the test design is typically done with the help of a data scientist, so they'll help you design you know, how, you know, how quickly you want to ramp and, and what the sample size is and so forth. Uh, the way we do it is we, there was a couple of slides I didn't show, but basically you, know, you can cut your audience in different ways, right? Uh, what we do is we try to get the biggest audience for that specific flow, 
And then because we have hundreds of experiments going on at the same time, what we do is we randomly hash the member IDs or the guest IDs so that we actually get uh, try to get as many people in random buckets, right? Um, so that's pretty standard procedure in A-B testing. Right? Everybody does that. Are there any statistical gotchas so you can share? One problem I'm seeing in practice is I see, you know, this test increased by 3%, here 4%, there 2%. So it seems like everything's, but then you look at the overall conversion rate and it's not really moving. And even though all the tests tell me I, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually one of the reasons why we, that specific one, I will go back to the gotchas, but what that specific thing is one of the reasons why we combined the metrics of the A-B testing system together with the BI, because we can say, oh, the A-B testing system says this, it should show up in the BI tools because it's the same number and the same, um, and so you can actually trace it back and exactly understand what's going on. Uh, oftentimes, if you do multiple tests on the same proper, on the same page, for example, they will combine together and the result will be maybe lower than what the combination of these things is. Um, one of the biggest issues we have had in the past is that I mean, there are many, right? Statistical significance and getting that, like, um, a knowledge in the heads of the product managers is super important. <laughs> the other one is, um, even when it has, hits statistical significance at, you know, P005, right? Um, oftentimes it's not enough, right? You actually have to go way more uh, uh, deep because there are, because of the sample sizes, in some cases they're very low. You might think it's statistically significant. Analytically it is but in reality it's not actually a real result, right? And so you have to wait longer. That's where the, um, some of the um, drill down tooling that we built helps because you can actually go and look at, oh, this, this signal is so weak that you really cannot trust it. Uh, but that's work in progress. Um, what we want to do in the general sense is automate as much as possible those flags so that people don't get in the gotchas, right? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you um, reduce the noise in your tests? Like, for example, the, the one that you showed with the different um, trial options, yeah? Um, you were talking about conversions there. So how many steps away from the initial page is that conversion, or are you talking about a conversion as just clicking on that link? Um, no, the, the metric can be anything, right? So we measure 3,000 metrics across the site on a consistent basis. So the metric could be also a few steps afterwards, right? Obviously, the farther you go, the less statistically significant it gets. Um, but um, you can choose a metric that's on that page, or you can choose a metric that's on the next page, or the following page, or in a different part of the experience. For example, um, downloads of the app. Um, beyond connecting, downloading the app is another huge driver of engagement, but that engagement happens a few days afterwards, right? So what you want to do is to keep that cohort and then measure it over a longer period of time. Uh, that can be done, but it just need, requires more time. Yeah. Last question. I, I, <laughs> so uh, my question is regarding targeting of these tests. So in many cases, if you have an A-B test, one variation would, would, which would perform well for a certain segment would not perform as well for another one. So how are you making these uh, targeting decisions given all of these uh, data points that you have at LinkedIn? Yeah, um, so another feature with, which I didn't show is because the metrics are computed on a per member level, you can actually slice and dice them after the fact. So you can go back, this is a, a, a feature that, uh, that's part of the A-B testing system. You can go after the experiment is run, even a month later, you've ramped it down, it's all done, all the data is, you know, there's, there's nothing left there. But the data stays, and so you can go back and reanalyze the data with different cuts. Um, and so we have a um, tool where you can go in and you can say, oh, I want to rerun this experiment, in double quotes, but now only looking at a specific segment. And you can segment those users in any way you wish because it's member IDs. So you, you know, we have different, a different part of the system um, has a segmentation system. Um, and basically you can say, I want only career starters in France, or I want only mobile users in Denmark. Um, and you can rerun these, these, these numbers afterwards. Obviously you need to know what you're looking for because there's so much, right? Um, so we didn't build yet an automatic system that will actually point out, hey, it's working better for certain segments or not. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's the short answer. Okay, time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you.